feature only men, but the burden of war is carried by women who have to leave home, which is destroyed, look after the children, and most often in our day, move to the refugee camps. And we have no idea how hard it is, but I've here, I have here with me Harriet Sandys, who spent a lifetime in the debris of war, looking after the refugees. She has written a book, Beyond the Last Blue Mountain, My Silk Road Journey. Why Silk Road? We will ask her why the Silk Road. She's been in Pakistan, she's been in many other places where there's war and, and the damage of war. She's been in Yugoslavia, she's Afghanistan, Pakistan, and many other places that she will tell us about. Uh, I will ask her to introduce her project and then we will get to talking. Good afternoon, it's a um, great pleasure for me to be here, great honor to be here. Uh, my first time back in Pakistan for 27 years, and um, a pleasure to introduce you to my book, um, Beyond That Last Blue Mountain. This is my first book. Um, I was listening to a lady this morning who said that her mother wrote her first book at 85. Uh, I'm not quite that old, but it's never too late to begin to write your first book. Um, it's a personal memoir, and it's about my life living and working the first eight years, um, between 1982 and 1995, in Peshawar, and uh, then inside Afghanistan. And then I moved from there because of, um, it was difficult for me to continue working in Peshawar at that time because of the um, Taliban. I went to uh, Iraqi Kurdistan at the time of the first Gulf War, and I uh, went through there with the Peshmerga and then to Bosnia-Herzegovina during the Balkan conflict. And finally, the book ends with Syria. And what I've done is I've brought um, a little PowerPoint presentation to give you a taster of the book. Um, and then uh, I'll go through it fairly quickly. A lot of it might not be terribly um, applicable, um, but uh, it gives you an idea of what I was up to. And then Harlan, I think, will ask me a few more questions. And then you might like to ask me some questions as well. So the title comes from a verse in Hassan, written by James Elroy Flecker, my favorite poet. And um, it's, uh, the merchants of Baghdad are speaking these words. They are just leaving the sanctuary of the walled city of Baghdad, and they're about to depart with their camels, laden with oriental carpets and precious silks. And they're going to go across the desert to the oasis towns. And these deserts were full of robbers, so obviously um, they're a bit nervous. But um, if you read the words, we are the pilgrims, master, we shall go always a little further. It may be beyond that last blue mountain, barred with snow, across that angry or that glimmering sea. And it seemed to me, um, it resonated with me, because I too was a merchant, buying Afghan carpets and kilims, and artifacts and bringing them back to sell in London. And like Rudyard Kipling's Kim, I would spend days in the bazaars with the merchants. Over the years, I was always traveling that little bit further. And all the countries mentioned in the book uh, have wonderful mountains, and often at certain times of the day or when the snow is on the mountains, they look blue. I was born in London, and I was the youngest of my parents, three children, that's me and the pram. And um, when I was four, my parents decided to move the whole family to the northwest of England. Um, my father's family had lived in this part of England for nearly 500 years, farming the land. And um, they would cut down hazel trees to make charcoal, and this was used for smelting iron ore. My life was comfortable, very privileged, and um, sheltered, very sheltered from the outside world. Surrounded by spectacular mountains and fells, I spent nearly every day riding my horse uh, across the fells. 
And on some days, I'd even ride my horse into the lake. Um, my parents never knew where I was from one moment to the next. And I think it's this wonderful freedom that they gave me as a child growing up uh, that made me adventurous, <clears throat> independent, and not afraid to take risks. And um, when I was 18, my... Um, hang on, just get back there. Oops. Oh, no, 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 no. When I was 18, my mother asked me what I was going to do with my life. I'd left school at 16 and just completed two years at various finishing schools. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And this might surprise you, but no woman in my family had ever been to university or had a profession. Um, my pa parents considered marriage to be my goal. And at 18, my mother was a Wren, that's a Women's Royal Naval Service during the Second World War, um, as a signals operator. And so she'd experienced war and had some excitement in her life. It had brought a different way of life um, than that prescribed by her parents. And her mother, my grandmother, had been an ambulance driver aged 19 during the First War. So she too had um, experienced war. Um, but there was nothing like that when I was growing up, no sort of excitement. So I was sent off to London to be a secretary. Um, I was lucky enough when I was 23 to visit Afghanistan, visiting all the archaeological sites. This is the Valley of the Buddhas um, of Bamiyan, and um, there are two statues carved out of the sandstone rock face, and the little holes you can see in the rock face are the um, caves where the monks would live. This is the largest of the two Buddhas. And you can still see the holes in the structure where ropes were draped. Uh, wooden pegs would be inserted in the wooden holes. And from the wooden holes, the um, ropes would be draped. And then over that, gypsum and um, wheat would be uh, smeared across the ropes. And this would create the folds of his robes. And his face would have been gilded gold, and his hands would have been gold. And um, what a magnificent sight he must have been to the weary merchants coming up from India and from China and from Persia when they saw that uh, the sun glittering off his face. I feel so lucky to have visited Afghanistan before the Soviet invasion. Um, the people were warm and welcoming and the country unspoiled. And this um, journey really changed my life forever. It was while I was in Afghanistan that I bought my first oriental textile, a camel saddlebag and my love of Afghan carpets and textiles has remained with me to the present day. The Soviet army entered Afghanistan in December 1979, and the resulting war between them and the Mujahideen uh, started, and huge numbers of Afghans began to come across the mountains. When I arrived in 1983, there were two million. By the time I left in 1991, there were six million refugees. Um, on, clear day, on certain days, um, sorry, just, uh, uh, my parents, as you can well imagine, were less than happy to see their daughter in her mid-twenties disappearing off to the northwest frontier. And they obviously uh, felt anxious for my safety and disappointment that after sending me to so many finishing schools, I'd not turned out to be the daughter they expected. I had tried to conform, but now I wanted to be free to be me. Um, it was a difficult decision to break away as no child wants to disappoint their parents, but I felt such a powerful need to do something worthwhile. Um, I went to Afghanistan, in, in, to Pakistan, to Peshawar in 1983, and I was um, looked after for four days by Masood Khalili, the son of Khalilullah Khalili, uh, Afghanistan's famous poet and Persian poet laureate. And he took me to the orphanage, took me to the hospitals, took me to the camps, and it really sort of opened my eyes to the horror of, of war. As I said, part of this book is about my eight years spent in Bashar. Um, and at this time, the city was full of Afghan refugees, spies, a place of intrigue, gossip, and suspicion. And bombs, re bombs regularly exploded, and you could, on certain days, you could... Um, see the vapor trail from the Soviet fighter planes streaking across the Khyber Pass, uh, in the air above the Khyber Pass. Uh, my home was um, on Canal Bank Road, uh, number 10, and this was where the journalists stayed before leaving to cover the war inside Afghanistan. 
Um, the house, house was situated not far from Khyber Agency. And most expatriates considered our house to be a no-go area and preferred to live on the opposite side of the canal from number 10, which was deemed safer. During these years in Bashar, I bought Afghan carpets and textiles for my business in London, and I set up a small silk weaving income generating project uh, for Afghan silk weavers living in Pabi Jalazai refugee camp on the Grand Trunk Road. And um, the lady in the red head scarf is Gul Aga, uh, organizing the ch children for the camera. And her husband was Jalil, who wove lengths of silk on his traditional pit loom. He'd been working as a laborer, mending potholes on the Grand Trunk Road when I found him uh, in searing temperatures during the summer months. And being a mountain man, a man from, the, from, from northern Afghanistan, it, this was really difficult for him. And when I offered him a job weaving silk, he said yes, he'd prefer to stay back in his house with his wife and children. And we sold the silk through um, Save the Children US in the shops in Lahore, Karachi, and in Dubai. Life in Peshawar was never dull. Every Friday, the Afghans played their national game of Butzkashi, which means literally goat dragging. Um, a goat was disemboweled, filled with wet sand, and the head and feet cut off, and the rider had to bend down and um, grab, grab the carcass, uh, pull it across the saddle, and gallop to um, a post at the end of the, uh, in the desert. And sometimes, if I was very lucky, the Mujahideen would allow me to ride their horses before the match at Shasada. During the hot season, Fiona Gall, the daughter of the ITN newscaster and author Sandy Gall, uh, would ride out at dawn um, amongst the poppy fields, the opium poppy fields. And these small Afghan stallions belonged to the French charity Médecins Sans Frontières. In 1987, I was commissioned by Cubby Broccoli to buy the costume for the James Bond film, The Living Daylights. Uh, and I was able to purchase everything uh, in the bazaars of Bashar. My book actually opens with the funeral of Bacha Khan, or Ghaffar Khan, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, um, in Jalalabad. And I was living in Bashar at the time of his death. And when the Afghan government issued a four day cessation of hostilities, um, between the government and the Mujahideen, many of us made the journey from Peshawar to Jalalabad. Um, at the end of the 1980s, the Russians withdrew from Afghanistan and the refugees uh, were being encouraged to return home. I was asked by UNESCO if I'd be willing to travel to Mazai Sharif in northern Afghanistan to run a training program with the last remaining silk ikat weavers. And before the war, sericulture, that's the production of silk, had been a thriving industry. Men and women would wear clothes made from ikat, a complicated technique of tie-dyeing the silk warps before weaving. Ikat is only woven in a few countries in the world. Good Guatemala, Japan, Gujarat in India, and it's thought that this, intri this intricate technique of weaving arrived in Central Asia from China via the Silk Road. Before the war, the sericulture, um, sorry, high altitude bombing had destroyed the irrigation channels and mulberry trees on which the silkworm fed. And there was a real danger that silk weaving, and in particular, the knowledge of this very intricate method of tie dyeing silk, was being lost forever. I'll just show you a few slides of some of the weavers that I worked with. And I think I'll probably end there. I've, um, the rest of the, the um, slide presentation is about Iraq and Bosnia. Um, but I think probably um, Harlid might want to ask me a few questions. And um, so might you. Yeah, thank you. Actually, that explains why the book title says My Silk Road Journey. She was actually teaching silk weaving all over the place. And I think at one point I, I was reading that she actually came to Lahore and taught some silk weaving uh, around the forest of Changamanga. Is, well, I was, what was that? I went, um, there was a Pakistani uh, doctor who I met in Peshawar and he said, you must come to Lahore because if you're looking for silk cocoons for your silk project, you must come to Changamanga. Mm. They very kindly drove me out to Changamanga and I, 
learned all about um, the silk production from the ladies there, how they uh, went into the forest to collect the mulberry leaves and fed the silkworms. And um, there was actually a, an auction of cocoons while I was uh, in Changamanga, and they, all the cocoons were spread out on the roofs of the houses. It looked as though snow had fallen on the village. And they explained to me that they were using the heat of the sun to kill the pupa inside the cocoon so that it didn't make a hole in the cocoon and emerge as a butterfly because then, of course, you couldn't reel the silk off the, off the cocoon. So that was my, um, I mean, I have to say I didn't understand anything about the production of silk. So I slowly learned um, through my months and years living in, in Pakistan. Yeah, uh, she's been to many regions of Afghanistan and Pakistan, and she's met all sorts of people. In public life, uh, they're mostly men who are visible. The women are simply absent. Uh, she has met Turkmen, uh, the people from the Bamiyan, the Uzbeks, Pakhtun, Punjabis. Uh, could you say a few words? Uh, talking about the characteristics of the various regional identities. Um, well, how did you find them? What kind of behavior did you see? Well, um, I, because I was buying oriental carpets and textiles, I was going into the old city of Peshawar every day, into the bazaar, into Chalkyadgar and Andashir, and Murad Market and all these places. And so I was dealing with men and mainly um, I was dealing with Turkmen and Uzbeks. And because their own women have a long tradition of weaving carpets, uh, they treated me with great respect. Um, when I, the only difficulties I had were when I dealt with men. How's the, how's the Uzbek different from the Pakhtun? Oh, well, it's difficult to explain. That's quite a difficult question. I think. Um, in, in terms of civilized behavior. <laughs> very, very civilized, very civilized. Um, and one thing I discovered that we shared a very similar sense of humor, which surprised me enormously. Uh, I always remember going one evening, uh, it was a Thursday evening, and the Afghans were just closing up their shops because uh, it was going to be Juma Friday the next day. And I went into the shop of one Turkman and we were sitting down having a cup of tea and suddenly I heard, bah, bah, and I, I looked up and I said, what is that noise, what is that? And he said, tomorrow, Oriot. They always called me Oriot, they couldn't say Harriet. They always called me Oriot, Oriot Jan. Tomorrow, Juma, uh, my wife, my daughter's eating sheep. And he, he pointed to a, a trap door in the roof of his shop. He said, sheep, and I said, sheep? up there, and he got a bamboo ladder, and we climbed up the ladder, and we went through the trap door, and there was this beautiful, fat-tailed sheep, the size of a small donkey, eating alfalfa at the corner of the, of the roof. And he said, tomorrow, Oriot Jan, like this. And I said, oh, no, 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 you can't possibly uh, kill such a beautiful animal. And we, he laughed, and we began to play out this sort of charade of me, the horrified foreigner, that he was going to kill this lovely animal, and he laughing at me and saying, tomorrow, Juma, and we, we just laughed and laughed. I mean, it sounds silly telling you now, but every time I went back into his shop, he's, um, he, he, would, he only had to look at the trap door, and both of us would just dissolve into giggles. Um, so, uh, yes, the sense of humor, I think. With, with the Pashtuns, they were more um, I'm talking about the people from the tribal area. Yeah, okay. yeah, um, they were much more um, tense, and they didn't really approve of me being a woman on my <laughs> own to begin with. And they didn't really want to do business with me because they didn't take me seriously. Um, and they wanted to talk always about politics, and of course it was about the war, and they'd get more and more excited, and their voices would go up, and, and there was one Afridi who I used, had the most beautiful jewelry. And so I used to go to his shop, but he was incredibly difficult for me to deal with. And for about 20 minutes, I would have to sit quietly while he went on and on and on about the war. And as he got more and upset about everything, he, he, he was, became unintelligible. And so this went on for about a year. 
and um, visiting his shop. And then one day he said to me, um, oh, I asked him a question. I said, oh, how many children do you have? And he said, I have four boys. I said, don't you have any daughters? He said, no, 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 no daughter. And I looked at him and I said, are you sure you don't have a daughter? And he said, okay, I have one daughter. So I said, oh, how nice. And what is her name? And he said, Ariana. And I said, well, that's a beautiful name, Ariana. And I said, why, don't you, why didn't you tell me you had a daughter? And he suddenly went very quiet and he looked around his shoulder at the door to see nobody was listening at his little booth. And he said, whispering to me, I tell you, I didn't have a daughter because I don't want to love her because one day she will get married and go to another man, to another man's home. And suddenly I realized this man had feelings. And after that, our relationship really improved. And he said one time to me, um, why don't you, I brought some chocolates for his family. And he said, why don't you ever bring anything for me? And I thought, oh my goodness me, this would be completely wrong for me as a Western woman to bring this man from the tribal areas something, a gift. He might misconstrue it or think badly of me. So I said, well, what would you like me to bring you? And he had a big, long black beard, and he said, I would like you to bring me something for this. <laughs> so I, I understood that he meant some aftershave lotion. <laughs> and it just so happened um, that I had a friend who worked for a company that sold Old Spice aftershave. So when I was back in London, I said, he said, look, Harry, I'll give you a whole lot of free samples. So when I returned to Abdul Wahab's little shop, I said, here you are, a little gift from England. And he never said thank you. He just quietly put it under his patu, but I knew he was really pleased. <laughs> I think she was treated much better than another lady that we recall because she was reporting on Pakistan. Her name was Kim Barker. And in her book, she, she actually narrates that a man standing next to her kept pinching her backside. And every time she turned around, he'd apologize and do it again. <laughs> but um, <laughs> let, us, uh, let us turn back. I think this will be my last question before uh, it will become open for the house. Uh, how many times were you near a death um, occasion and, you know, starting the Abdul Ghaffar yeah, Khan? Yeah, I think yeah. there was a bomb blast yeah. there. Also. I used to go down every day to the old city <coughs> and uh, I had a little Suzuki pickup jeep and I was driving, I don't know how many of you know Bishar, I'm sure lots of you know it very well. I was coming down from University Town and I came over Jail Bridge and just on the right-hand side there was a parade of shops, Afghan shops, and there was a new, new shop had just opened up, so I thought, well, I'll park my Suzuki in the parking bay and I'll pop into the shop, I'll get, say hello to them and see if there's anything that I want to buy. And they were Hazaras from the center of Afghanistan, from Bamiyan area. And um, I sat down, had tea with them, and they just arrived, so they didn't have much in their shop that was of interest. And then I left the shop, got back into my Suzuki, and went down further into Kisakhwani and in Chaukyadgar, and Half an hour later when I came back, the entire parade of shops had been, um, was uh, wiped out. A bomb, had ob a car had obviously come in just after me, pulled into the parking lot and exploded and the whole shop had gone. So it was with half an hour and um, I would say, you know, uh, God must have been with me that day, I think. Yeah, we're open for questions. Any questions? <coughs> Yes. Uh, how did you manage with all the different languages? You've been to so many countries, speaking all different dialects and languages. Well, not everybody speaks English. No, no. Uh, when, with the merchants, um, I learned to speak Dari, and I went to night school in Peshawar three nights a week for two hours each evening. And two young Afghan men taught us. Um, Rather like um, we have something in England called TEFL, teaching English as a foreign language. So they taught us Dari as a, uh, and straight away to speak. We, so I never learned the script or the alphabet, but by the end of the two hours, I was able to say the greeting, which of course is very important. I couldn't just go into a shop and sit down and say, how much is that? You know, you have to sit down ask the elaborate greeting, and then perhaps have a cup of tea, ask about the, the, the merchant's family and, and children and things. 
And so that was a really important thing for me. And I learned how the numbers from one to a thousand, so that was useful when it came to bargaining prices of carpets and things, yeah. Can, so you, I learned say, to can, you, can you say something briefly? In uh, the Dari. Uh, in Dari later. Oh, <laughs> and Chituristi, Hubisti, Sahati Shimo Chituras. Let me, um, let me tell you that we all know Persian, but this pronunciation <laughs> is totally different. <laughs> well, it's Afghan Dari, and <laughs> yeah. it is nearly 30 years since I've been asked to speak it, so forgive me if I get, got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for this. It's actually. Yeah. Very much. <clears throat>